This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau, returning to old crime scenes, cell phone location tracking, investigating a child death, and police reform. I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. This is episode number 97 of the Writer's Detective Bureau. We're just three episodes away from episode 100. The podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional quality crime-related fiction. And this week, I'm answering your questions about returning to old crime scenes, how police can track the cell phone of a missing person, investigating a child death, and my thoughts on police reform. But first, as always, I have some people to thank. I need to thank Gold Shield patrons Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com, C.C. Jameson from CCJameson.com, Larry Keaton. Vicky Tharp of VickyTharp.com, Chris Ann, Larry Darter, Natalie Borelli, Craig Kingsman of CraigKingsman.com, Lynn Vitale, Marco Carocari of MarcoCarocari.com, Robert Mendenhall of RobertJMendenhall.com, Terry Swan, and Rob Kearns of Knights Fall Press for their support along with my Silver Cufflink and Coffee Club patrons. You can find links to all of the patrons supporting this episode by going to the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 97. And to learn about using Patreon to grow your author business or to support this podcast for as little as $2 per month, check out writersdetective.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. This week's first question comes from Marcus Wilkes, who asked, after a crime scene is closed and no longer guarded, and a detective wants to revisit it, do they still have to log their entry into the crime scene log, or do they just come and go as they please? Also, when is a crime scene, such as a house, released back to the owner for cleaning up? Thanks for the question, Marcus. In episode 51, I briefly talked about this, but this is a great opportunity to delve a little deeper. Reading into your question a bit, Marcus, I'm assuming we're talking about a murder that happens in a private residence. Like I talked about in episode 94 of the podcast, detectives would need to get a search warrant for the murder scene, which is called a Mincy warrant. Definitely check out episode 94 to learn more about Mincy warrants, but it's important to understand that search warrants, whether it's a Mincy warrant for a homicide scene in a house, um, a regular old search warrant for a suspect's apartment, or even a search warrant you serve on a bank to get a suspect's financial records, a search warrant is a one-time search. You can take as long as you reasonably need to complete the search. So if we're talking about a serial killer that used his 10-acre property as his personal cemetery, it would be reasonable for the search to take weeks. But that one-time search means the police must remain there the entire time. It could mean posting a uniformed officer at the scene overnight just to maintain the integrity of the crime scene, but the police cannot leave and then come back. If they do, they need another search warrant. A search warrant is basically a judge saying you, the police, have the right to search this location for evidence and to seize the evidence you list in the warrant to help you prove whatever crime you're alleging. But once you leave, you no longer have the right to search or even be inside this place again unless you have a warrant or someone with legal standing over the location gives you consent for you to return. So in your scenario, Marcus, your detectives could either get a second search warrant to go back in, or they could ask for consent from whomever is in control of the residence, like the landlord, to go back in. Even if they did, your detectives have a problem, and that's chain of evidence. Let's run through our scenario's timeline real quick so you can see what I mean. Person A kills person B in the residence. Let's say it's a shooting. Person A flees. Neighbor C calls 911 after hearing a gunshot in the house next door. Uniformed police officers arrive at the scene, make entry into the residence where the gunshot was heard, and find person A dead on the floor. Uniforms call out the detectives and the crime scene investigators and the coroner, so at this point the whole investigative cavalry is coming. The detectives arrive and talk to the uniform officers that went inside the house in response to that 911 call and get a briefing on what the officers observed while inside. So at this point, other than a protective sweep of the residence and checking person A to confirm that they're obviously dead, no one has actually searched for evidence at this point with respect to what's inside the house. One of the detectives writes a quick Mincy warrant and submits it to a judge. 
This might even be done via email or telephone. It's a pretty quick warrant. The Mincy basically says, I responded to a report of a possible homicide inside a single family residence at 678 Main Street. Neighbor C at 676 Main Street reported hearing a gunshot and called 911. Police officers Joe and Schmo responded to check the welfare of the occupants at 678 Main Street. Officers Joe and Schmo forced entry into the house after observing through the living room window a man down on the ground in a pool of blood. Officers Joe and Schmo believed exigent circumstances existed to make a warrantless entry into the residence in an attempt to save the subject's life. Upon entering the house and attempting to render aid, officers Joe and Schmo determined person A was obviously dead. And the officers conducted a protective sweep of the home and determined no one else was inside the residence. Neither Joe nor Schmo observed a firearm in the immediate area of the decedent. Officers Joe and Schmo froze the scene and awaited arrival of detectives. So based upon the facts set forth in this investigation thus far, your affiant, that's me, the author of the search warrant, believes probable cause exists to search the residence for evidence of an unlawful homicide and to seize the evidence listed in attachment A. And attachment A would be a list of all the things I'm looking for, like bullets and fibers and DNA and blood and weapons and, oh, I don't know, a dead body <laughs> and so on. So the Mincy would also include a request for CSI experts who are not sworn peace officers or police officers to be allowed into the scene as part of the investigation as well. So that's what we would submit to the judge and the judge would then sign it allowing allowing us to get started with the actual investigation. Now, anything we find as evidence at this point gets booked, and there is a clear chain of evidence. It came from a lockdown crime scene where there is an account of everyone that entered the scene, starting with officers Joe and Schmo. So if something is inside the residence, it was there before our officers walked in and may have possibly had a role in, in at least in understanding what happened inside the house. So if a crime scene investigator finds a spent shell casing under the sofa, that investigator puts it in a bag, seals it, and fills out the chain of evidence log that is on that sealed evidence bag. She then takes it to the station and puts it in evidence locker three. Realistically, she would include what she did with that evidence in her actual report. But in addition to that, she's logging it on the evidence bag itself. Now, the following day, the property officer takes the evidence out of locker three and logs it into the big evidence room in bin 37. He then writes his name on the chain of evidence or chain of custody form on that sealed bag, essentially saying that that was that movement from the evidence locker to the evidence room bin 37 was done by him. That afternoon, the property officer receives the request for the shell casing to be sent to the crime lab for testing. The property officer again writes his name and date on the chain of evidence form and explains that he took the evidence from the property room to the crime lab. And then when he hands over the evidence to the ballistics expert, let's say, they both sign the form, acknowledging that custody was transferred to the crime lab's ballistic guy. And this continues all the way up to the detective bringing it to court for the jury trial to have it entered into evidence during court. So from the time officers Joe and Schmo stepped into the apartment, we have an account of exactly where the evidence was and what happened to it. Does that make sense? Okay, so that brings us back to the chain of evidence problem we have if the detectives make a second trip to the crime scene. When the police left the crime scene after serving the Mincy warrant and doing the crime scene investigation initially, it was turned back over to whomever has legal control of the place. It could be the family of the decedent, a landlord, uh, or maybe there was no one to turn it over to and the police just locked the door on the way out. So if the detectives go back in now, there's no way to prove that whatever quote unquote evidence is found now, whether that was or wasn't there the first time they were there, was something planted after the police left the first time. Did the police plant this new piece of evidence themselves? How was this evidence not found the first time? These are all questions that could easily be raised by a defense attorney at trial, and realistically, anything found during the second search would likely not be admitted as evidence in court as the prosecution would have a really uphill battle accounting for its relevance and proof that it was not tampered with. And to answer your last question, Marcus, once the police leave after completing their search pursuant to that first warrant, the owner gets control of the scene again, and they are free to have the scene cleaned up. And I talk more about crime scene cleanup in episode 51 as well. So thank you so much for the question.
Erica Alexander asked our next question, and you can find Erica's work on her website, authorericaalexander.com, and that's Erica with a C. Erica writes, for a missing person case, an adult, if the police want to access the Find My Phone app and track the last whereabouts for that person, what would they have to do? The phone is also missing and turned off. Can they get access to that person's username or password and try to track the last location that way? Good question, Erica. The police would not likely use the app itself. They would go directly to the wireless provider like Verizon, AT&T, or whomever and request an exigent circumstance ping. In this case, the police would get back info from the phone company in about 15 minutes. Relatively recent privacy laws require the police officer that requested the emergency or exigent circumstance ping to follow up with getting a judge to sign a court order after the fact. Basically, the phone companies are saying, yes, we will help you find this person in an emergency, but to make sure you don't abuse this, you still have to go before a judge once the emergency is over and get the same type of court order, which is most likely a search warrant, that you would have had this not been an emergency. So as the creator of this scenario, Erica, you've made it so that the phone is turned off and missing, presumably along with the missing person. The phone company will likely provide the police of where the phone was the last time it was connected to the network, so wherever the phone pinged last before being shut off. Phones ping cell towers all the time, not just when the phone is ringing or when texts are being sent. So the time of the last ping will be pretty close to when the phone was turned off or the battery died. What will really differ is the quality of the location data. Most modern smartphones have the capability of providing their GPS location pretty accurately, assuming the phone is in an area with decent cell service coverage, especially with relation to data coverage. So if the phone had full LTE signal, the phone company would probably have GPS coordinates to provide to the police, along with a radius of accuracy, which is usually measured in meters. So it would be something like the phone last pinged at 1725 hours within 5 meters of 34.134096 north by minus 118.325548 west degrees for that GPS coordinate. Now let's say that the phone is up in the mountains and has one bar of 3G service on its last ping. The phone isn't getting the signal required most likely to send its GPS data, but it is still connected to the wireless network. The phone company will triangulate the signal based upon whatever cell towers the phone is able to connect with. So a singular cell tower will divide up its signal directions into thirds. So imagine a map with a dot that is our cell tower. Now draw a circle around that cell tower, but divide it into thirds, making the circle kind of look like a Mercedes-Benz logo. The phone company will be able to tell the police which third in that circle, or which piece of the wedge the phone was in. And if the phone was able to hit two or three towers at the same time, we can plot out the general area where that phone may have been, which would be the starting point for our search party. Thanks for the question, Erica. I hope this helps. The next few questions come from Reverend Dr. Sarah Hinlicky Wilson. She writes, Dear Adam, this is a different request from the usual. I was just wondering if you'd be willing to say something on the podcast about the police generally as an institution and your own views on their role. What's good and what's not? I think a lot of us are really distressed by all the abolish the police talk. I'm sure you are too. And probably also a lot of us feel that there should be reform. But it seems really hard to come by accurate statistics, insightful interpretation of those statistics, and actually workable proposals for reform. I'd understand if you didn't want to go there at all, but it may be that you're the only cop some of us know in any way, shape, or form, so your views would carry extra weight. On a totally different topic, and related to writing, though not necessarily detective or crime fiction, I'm writing a story in which a little boy sneaks out of his country home at night in winter, climbs a ladder to a roof, and falls to his death. Cheerful, right? What role would police play in this, if at all, when his family finds out in the morning? Do they remove the body, or does an ambulance? 
For the plot, it has to be clear that the family is in no way to be blamed. He's a rambunctious kid who takes an idea into his head. Would the police or county press charges? What if someone has a grudge against the family and wanted to report them or get them in trouble with child services? Would that then move from police to child protective services? I'd be glad for any light you could shed, especially on how all these service departments interact with each other. All the best, Sarah. I'm going to start with the easy one first. With regards to your story, the police play the role of the fact finder. They're trying to find out what happened and if those circumstances and facts and evidence point toward a crime being committed or not. The body itself is moved by the coroner or the medical examiner, and they will obviously do the investigative steps that relate to the body itself, so the autopsy and toxicology and so on. Whether the police present the case to a prosecutor for charges really depends on what they uncover as far as evidence goes. Child Protective Services or Child Welfare Services or whatever they call that agency in that jurisdiction are typically concerned with investigations of children that are alive, first of all, um, but they're typically concerned with two things in their investigations. Number one is determining maltreatment. So in other words, is the allegation of abuse or neglect or maltreatment substantiated? So in this regard, what happened in the past? And number two, they're concerned about assessing the risk of maltreatment. In other words, what is likely to happen in the future? When crimes are reported to CPS or CWS, they are cross-reported to law enforcement. So if there were prior allegations of maltreatment relating to this child, the police should already have a record of it in the form of a cross-report. So as an example, the child comes to school with bruising that may be indicative of abuse. The child's teacher is a mandated reporter, so the teacher makes a report to CPS that the child came to school with bruising. That report is also forwarded by CPS to the police department as well. CPS will usually do their own interviews, but it is common to have CPS request law enforcement respond to assist or at least be present during the interview. And then if an arrest is going to be made and the case prosecuted, it's going to be the police that make that arrest and do that criminal investigation while CPS works on placing the child in a safer environment. So in your scenario, Sarah, CPS wouldn't really be involved in the investigation of the death other than to possibly provide any info they had about the child if there had been previous reports. The police would be the ones trying to determine if a crime had been committed or if this was just a very sad accident. I will include a Child Protective Services Guide for Caseworkers authored by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office on Child Abuse and Neglect, and it goes into great detail on how CPS investigations and assessments are handled, even including specific interviewing techniques. So it's a pretty good deep dive when it comes to learning about the CPS role and what they can do. You can find the guide in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 97. Now to the tougher questions Sarah posed, which were, what are my thoughts about the police generally as an institution and your own views on their role and my thoughts on reform? Sarah also mentioned that it seems really hard to come by accurate statistics, insightful interpretation of those statistics, and actually workable proposals on reform. As an institution, policing is the toughest and single most important thing a government does. Think about it. Without laws, there is no governance, no agreed upon rules or norms of society. And without enforcement of those rules, norms, or laws, there is no civilized society. Enforceable laws date back to the cradle of civilization, to Babylonia circa 1754 BC. Without them, there's only lawlessness. And a lot fewer attorneys, but I digress. If we look at society like an epidemiologist looks at an organism, law enforcement is the immune system. And right now, society is experiencing an autoimmune disease, which we should be terrified about because it's usually fatal for an organism. I live and work in California, as most of you know, which has actually taken the lead in police reform. Some of it is smart and needed, but most of it is myopic and dangerous. And the reason that is, is because we aren't asking the right questions. The most effective way 
to solve problems is to ask better questions. And those with the power to solve these problems are not asking questions. They're making assumptions based upon headlines. But we all do that. We've outsourced our critical thinking to those that profit from spoon-feeding us answers to questions we haven't asked, knowing that we'll gobble it up because we will mindlessly consume content based upon confirmation bias. We need to ask better questions and use critical thinking to come to our own conclusions rather than regurgitate the talking head we like most on television. So rather than me telling you what I think should be done, and having half of you wanting to fight me and half of you taking what I say as gospel, allow me to ask you some questions. What would your neighborhood look like a year from now if the police were abolished? What would other neighborhoods, you know, the ones you don't actually go to, look like? If there were no police, would you stop at red lights? Would others? How would that change the way you feel about driving? What would it feel like to be an unarmed social worker that is assuming the emergency response role previously filled by a police officer in a violent and well-armed first world country? Have you ever been in a physical fight for your life? What rules did you follow during that fight? What would you do if you called 911 and no one answered? Would you or anyone you know want to spend the next 20 or 30 years in law enforcement? If not, why not? Of the calls you see law enforcement responding to, how many can you correlate to a broken or non-existent education system, mental health system, housing system, or medical system? How has your perception of law enforcement changed in the last 10 years, and how much of that shift was the result of news media reporting versus firsthand experience? Where do you get your news? Do you consciously look or listen for when the story shifts from reporting facts to pushing an opinion or blame? Do you fact check the stories you encounter and then reshare online? Do you understand how companies use what you post online to profile you and then skew the content you're going to see in the future? How is that skewing the way you see the world? When's the last time you left your phone at home for an entire day? Did you feel more or less anxiety or anger? So if you come to the conclusion that media is skewing your views and police are actually needed in society, what are you going to do to keep this experiment in democracy afloat? I believe we're in a far more delicate position in relation to the survival of our society as we know it than we're willing to admit. Not to sound all chicken little on you, I mean, I hope I'm wrong about that, but I fear that I'm right. As a refugee from the Middle East once told me, You never think you can lose your country until it happens to you. And it happens so fast. The biggest reform this country needs right now is to start actually listening to what each other has to say. And the best way to be heard and have it stick is through the power of storytelling. Storytelling.